Now, finally, I want to welcome everyone to the Pacific Seminar Series with the Australian Centre for Pacific Islands Research. I think uh, most of our participants here today know me, but if you don't, I am Bridget Horsey and I'm going to host the seminar for you today. Uh, in this seminar, you hear from Sarah Carlson and Matthew Norman of Ocean Ventures Fiji, which is a conservation and education minded uh, diving operation based in Natua Bay in Vanua Levu. Sarah and Matthew have both worked with International Conservation and Education Organization Operation Wallacea. I, I may have pronounced it wrong, sorry. Um, that was right. Oh, great. Um, and it's in numerous countries, including Honduras, Dominica, Indonesia, and, and Mexico. Um, and this was before founding Ocean Ventures in 2017 in a remote part of Fiji, uh, alongside a village that had never really received tourists before. Uh, Sarah and Matthew, they mix their backgrounds as party instructors, um, instructors with their passion for coral reef conservation to deliver educational programs and to implement restoration initiatives with the local communities lining the Natua Bay. Now, I could probably keep um, telling you about the fantastic work that we've seen in that bio and abstract um, for Sarah and Matthew and all their work that they're involved in, but I'm going to leave that for them to share with you today. Uh, if you do have any questions throughout the session um, for Sarah and Matthew, just pop them into the chat and we'll allow some time to cover these at the very end. And now I won't take up any more of your time and I'm going to pass you over to Sarah and Matthew. So thank you. Manaka, Bridget. Ah, uh, Manaka. <laughs> Bula Manaka, everybody. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us today for our seminar. Uh, building Resilience in Rural Communities on Benua Levu, Conservation, Education, and Ecotourism Projects in Natibo Bay. Uh, we'll apologize in advance if we have any issues with our connectivity. Um, we, we're on our, our Fiji internet, so um, apologies if maybe our, our video is more of a slideshow or if we break up at any point and mm -hmm. maybe you can let us know. All right. So I'm Sarah. And I'm Matthew. And um, together we founded Ocean Ventures Fiji in 2017. Um, we're a diving and snorkeling operation with a focus on education and conservation initiatives. So previously we had worked um, in various projects in places like Malaysia, Dominica, um, Honduras, um, and a couple other countries, but we were brought to Fiji in 2016 um, and we immediately fell pretty hard for Natewa Bay. And we're operating exclusively out of Natewa Bay, which is on uh, Fiji's second largest island of Vanilu. So we're about 40 minutes outside of our closest town, which is um, Sabu Sabu, uh, which is also the location of Coco Mana Chocolate, which will be on any of your stops to Sabu Sabu. <laughs> So we tried to be involved with the progression of tourism in Fiji, um, especially here in Sabu Sabu. Um, so we're members of the Duavata Sustainable Tourism Collective and of the Sabu Sabu Tourism Association. Um, to describe where we're located in Fiji, Vanuelevu is the second largest island, um, also known as Fiji's friendly north. Um, Sabu Sabu is the closest town, um, it's known as Fiji's hidden paradise, as only around 2% of Fiji's tourism make it to this island. So by having like lower population levels and plenty of land, uh, farming is the major source of income on Venua Levu. Um, so there's, for example, lots of sugarcane farming, kava farming, um, and every sort of fruit and vegetable that you can imagine for the tropics, um, and cocoa farming as well. Which is some of our favorite farming. <laughs> um, if we zoom in on Phantom Levy, you can see that Matewa Bay is the large long body of water that almost divides the island into two. So the Natewa Peninsula, um, which is the smaller bit that's only connected by, by really a small stretch of land, I think half a kilometer, mm -hmm. um, that peninsula is ecologically important because it contains several endemic species, um, high levels of biodiversity, um, so along with our neighboring island of Taviuni, which is right in the corner, uh, the Natewa Peninsula and Taviuni are home to some of uh, Fiji's most biodiverse regions. Um, Natewa Bay is the largest bay in the South, South Pacific, um, just a little over 80 kilometers long, 
and it's a geological fault line, which means the bay reaches depths of over 1500 meters in the middle. And it's about 15 kilometers wide, um, so very, very large. Um, and we're based all the way near the very end of Natewa Bay. Uh, so we're only about a 30 minutes or so drive from Savu Savu, but you're really entering a, a different region of Fiji when you come out to Natewa Bay. Um, it's pretty untouched tourism wise, and, and in general, it's got very low population levels. So it's. Um, it does feel like a really remote part of Fiji, even though it's different experience from some. Um, Natoba might be well known, uh, might might not be well known globally, um, but locally, it's it's uh, well known for its stunning hard corals. It's got very low population, so the bay is lined with several traditional villages um, and some small settlements and like very small communities within within those. Um, but these communities have a very strong sense of ownership of their reefs. So Fijians have what is known as like an Ngoli Goli, which um, is their like fishing area. So each village or community has a set Ngoli Goli, um, and that's where they go to get their, their fish. Um, and they also have what are called tambus that they place on parts of the reef at certain times. So a tambu is like, it's like taboo, it's like a a no take area. So, for example, if a chief passes away or someone with high standing in the village passes away, they might place a tambu on the reef out of respect for like 100 days, or they might have a more permanent tambu in place, um, especially if they're starting to see benefits, like spillover benefits of having um, an area of their reef protected. So this has been going on for generations. There's kind of this natural conservation of the resources anyway um even if they don't have like a, a full understanding of um what that no-take area means and how it's how it's replenishing their fish populations so we'll attempt to play a video for you um it might come across as more of a slideshow of stills but we wanted to give you like a little introduction um to Natewa bay and and why we think it's a really amazing place so as as we've already mentioned, um, it, it's it's known for um, healthy hard corals with a lot of biodiversity, which uh, which which then for, uh, forms a habitat for for hundreds of species of, of reef fish. We're we're cataloguing the the fish in the bay, and um, we're at about four hundred and fifty different species of, uh, of fish so far. And because you don't have the larger boats or commercial fishing, it's mostly um, sustenance fishing. Um, so mostly done by spear fishing, um, sometimes by day, sometimes by night. Um, so luckily, most of the fish populations are still pretty healthy, um, but there is some fishing pressure. There are um, some issues with poaching, for example, like sea turtles are illegal to fish in Fiji, but in parts um, around here, especially where there's no enforcement from fisheries. There can be kind of varying levels of um, of adhesion to that to that law. Um, but we do see all of the fun like apex predators, like sharks, and also some uh, schooling fish such as uh, rainbow runners, uh, mackerel, uh, tuna. We also have um, a couple of resident pods of spinner dolphins, and especially in the cooler months, like um, August, a cooler Fiji standard month, uh, we do see some larger cetaceans like uh, humpbacks, um, some minke whales. whales. And I think we had a sighting of an orca um, in, in last year. So, um, and it's because it's such a deep water bay and so sheltered, it does seem to attract. Um, a lot of different a lot of different wildlife and the, and the, and the calm conditions compared to the, the ocean, open ocean as well. Mm. So what brought us here originally was um, an international conservation organization called Operation Wallacea or OPWAL for short. Um, so Matthew and I had both been involved with various projects through Operation Wallacea um, and we met at their their research site in Honduras. Um, but they decided to set up a new research site in, um, in Fiji with the Nambu Conservation Trust. 
Um, so they they kind of reached out to us and said, how would you like the idea of moving to Fiji? And we said, well, that sounds great. Um, so we opened up our, our business with the idea of helping out on the marine portion of these expeditions. Um, Operation Wallacea runs volunteer tuition-based um, conservation expeditions. So their model is to charge volunteers, so school students um, and university students. So the schools come in groups with a teacher um, and they pay to come out and help with, with data collection. Um, and because there's lots of people, it helps us like really large spatial data sets they can cover a lot of habitat analysis um you know measuring trees at diameter breast height for for several people is a lot easier than just one um but because they're volunteer tuition based they don't need to rely on grant funding to work in the same location year after year so even though Operation Wallacea is UK based, they have partnerships in 15 countries worldwide. And the idea is that they return to those countries year after year to continue data collection. So they have large temporal data sets, large spatial data sets and standardized survey protocols. And that way they can compare data that they collect here in Fiji to data that they collect in Madagascar or Honduras. Um, and then the students get the opportunity to work alongside academics who are running the various projects. The academics are funded by the tuition. Um, and so the students are gaining that experience of what field work is really like, um, all the ups and downs of field work, um, and getting to experience what a remote culture is like, in our case, in Fiji, um, in a village. So. Operation Wallacea, ultimately, they use their like published papers, their, their publications, um, and that data to lever funding to protect the areas in which they work. So the idea is with long term, um, large data sets that they're able to more successfully lever funding for protecting areas of high biodiversity. Um, so they, that's why they tried to do the biodiversity data and the habitat analysis in the same locations um for, for just a stronger data set so here in fiji operation Wallacea has been running since 2017 that was our first season um, and it happens each year except when we have a global pandemic um so it will hopefully be resuming in june 2022 or will be resuming in june 2022 for a four-week season um, but in the first three years that we were running the project, um, this community saw over 500 students from nine different countries. So students come in groups from places like Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, Germany, Japan, um, and they come and spend two weeks in Fiji. So their first two days are spent in a village homestay. Um, they get to learn about life in a traditional Fijian village. So they visit the farm, they're husking coconuts, making coconut oil, mat weaving, um, preparing lobo dinners, and just enjoying life with a Fijian family. Um, and then we send them trekking up to a forest camp, um, which is also run by that village community. Um, and in the forest camp, they're helping out with those biodiversity and habitat analysis surveys um, before they come down to the marine site. And that's where Ocean Ventures Fiji is involved. So at the marine camp, um, the students are doing their paddy open water. So they're learning how to scuba dive uh, and they're doing a reef ecology course. Um, we also train them in various survey methods like benthic transects, which help us um, help us to understand the health of the seed floor. Um, so you're looking at things like percentage of live coral cover um versus dead coral versus algae um and then also we have a, a stereo video system um which is basically a fancy computer software that allows us to do video analysis of fish populations um and by having two cameras it allows us to understand or have a better estimate of the fish biomass so we're training students in doing transects with the stereo video as well um with operation Wallacea, with these uh, biodiversity surveys that they were doing up in the forest. Um, it led to the discovery of the Natewa swallowtail, um, Papilio Natewa, um, with one of the local guides and with um, Dr. Vasheshni Chandra from uh, Fiji National University. 
Uh, and so there's been the discovery and the description of a new species, um, but the long-term goals of Operation Malicia in Fiji are to protect um, Matagali owned land, so a community owned land um, linked together in the hopes of creating a national park um, on the Natewa Peninsula and ultimately levering funding um, for these areas that have high biodiversity um, and high carbon storage as well. One of, one of the, uh, the, the nicest things about the pro project is that with the involvement of the local communities with the, with the village homestays, um, guides and cooks for the, for, for the, for the two sites, um, that the, there is a, 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 a good amount of income going directly to those communities. Yes, so for the for the homestay portion, obviously that the students are hosted um, within the village and at the forest camp, um, the village runs all that, you know, the cooking, the, the accommodation at the forest camp. And then our marine camp is based in the village of um, Busaratu, which we'll be talking about next. Um, so Busaratu has been highly involved with Operation Malicia since the very beginning. Since 2017. Yeah. Um, so the village has, is, is quite unique, really. It's got access to biodiversity-rich rainforest and the reefs of Natero Bay, which makes them uh, um, uniquely positioned. Um, so they set up several village um, committees to, to manage their nat natural resources, both terrestrial and marine. So Vusa Ratu's experience with hosting visitors, um, along with its access to ecologically important areas of forest and reef, um, provide some opportunities for the community to directly benefit from, from tourism. So one of our longer term projects um, with several partners from both like private and public sector um, is the establishment of Vusaratu Eco Tours. Yeah, so um, the, the, the idea of the, of the Eco Tours is that it's, it's going to be 100% uh, community owned and uh, operated. Um, Really encompassing the strengths that the that the village has, so um, the, the experience with home homestay accommodation, um, partly through their involvement with the Operation Wallacea project, um, they have this beautiful forest. Um, so bird watching and treks treks in the forest. There's a um, there's a new um, butterfly house that will hopefully um, be a home for the newly discovered species. Um, and then they have this uh, beautiful reef um, right out the front of the village. Um, so it's the, the opportunity, the coral nurseries that have been in place since um, uh, since last year. So it's been a um, big, big effort with lots of different people involved. So primarily Vusaratu, of course, um, their their passion for hosting people and for sharing their resources. Um, is what has driven the project forward, um, but with help from um, from organizations like Nature Fiji, um, Marangeti Viti, uh, Kokomana, um, who have been invaluable in, in establishing the Balinimbe, the, the Butterfly House, um, also thanks to funding from SPC, uh, the Swallowtail and Birdwing Butterfly Trust, the U.S. Embassy. Um, and we've also had assistance from ADI for um, establishing our coral nursery in, in Busaratu, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Just a minute. So the, the island of Van Willow experienced two uh, direct cyclone hits recently. Um, severe Category 5 cyclone Yasa in December 2020, and then followed swiftly afterwards by um, Category 3 cyclone Anna um, in, in January 2021. Um, both storms caused a lot of damage um, on Vanuvalu and and some of the surrounding islands as well. Uh, homes and schools were damaged. Lots of roofs uh, ripped off and destroyed. Um, crops ruined and significant coastal erosion. Um, it, in addition to the the, the toll the storm took on um, the natural resources, the forests and lots of um, storm surge because the storm came from, from the north. So a lot of um, the, the, the shallow reefs on, on our side of the Natero Bay took a, took a bit of a hit. Yeah, um, and we mentioned before that our island relies heavily on agriculture 
Um, so the cyclones were a big hit to um, to Veno Alevu, which is already hurting a bit from the lack of tourism due to COVID. Um, so it was a bit of a, a tough time, but that's also when you really do feel the the sense of community and um, you know the resilience in Fiji. Um, in the photo on the left, you can see one of our favorite corals. Um, both before, so November 2020, and after the cyclone, and the difference the two cyclones in such a short space of time um, cause. Corals are like the ecosystem architects, so they provide that you know diverse habitat for reef fish. So that's another difference in the two photos is that beforehand you had all this um, perfect habitat for reef fish populations and um, and a lot of invertebrates. And unfortunately, just big boulders, um, big, big chunks of coral were, were tossed about. Um, and the other photo on there shows several of the table corals that had just been um, also tossed around by the storm surge. So we found in general, most of the exposed reefs on the southeast, the southeast side of Manitoba Bay had um, experienced a lot of damage. That's really what inspired us to start our coral restoration. Um, so with our coral restoration efforts in Natoa Bay, uh, they were all, all spurred on by um, Cyclone Yasa and Cyclone Anna. Um, we had plenty of cyclone uh, and of cyclone rubble of live pieces of coral um, scattered throughout the, the sea floor. Um, and coral needs a stable substrate to bind to. Um, so coral is an animal and um, it has a symbiotic algae that lives within it, so it needs access to light. Um, so when Matthew and I first visited the reefs after the cyclones, we started with just um, some direct repositioning of broken corals directly back onto the reef for reattachment. So for, for, for example, we, we, we spent quite a few dives where uh, we probably corrected um, the orientation of, um, of maybe 150 to 200 table corals. And so some of those might reattach to the reef. Um, coral grows very slowly, only a few centimeters per year, but it also grows more quickly when it's been disturbed. Um, so hopefully some of those that have been righted or put into a place where they're stable have the chance for the coral to grow and rebind to the substrate um, and attach once again. No, we're, we're very mindful that um, nature will um, re re restore itself if, if, if given half a chance. Um, so all of our um, reef and coral restoration efforts really um, just trying to give, uh, give, the, give the reef a helping hand, really give uh, hope. The boost. Yeah. Hope, hope nature takes this course. Nursery. So Matthew and I got some materials together, um, really basic materials. Uh, we had two frames welded and um, and we used ropes and the rope nurseries allow us to position a large number of coral fragments. Um, we had so much live coral rubble, so just live pieces of coral that were um, kind of rolling around on the on the shallow reef. Um, and so by having the rope nurseries, it allowed us to have three to four hundred coral fragments in a pretty small area, um, which is why we chose that method. Um, so the rope nurseries were a good match for for the type of reefs that we're working in. But we didn't uh, want to stop at, at two nurseries um, because we were mindful of the fact that the the, the there was quite a bit of damage at, uh, at several reefs. Um, so thanks to the generous support from AVI, Australian Volunteers, uh, we managed to secure um, a, a grant to implement a further eight coral nurseries in Terrell Bay. Um, so this funding provided the opportunity to work with several uh, of our partner communities in the Terrell Bay. And now we've got a, a total of 10 rope nurseries um, at five different reefs and between three and four thousand coral fragments um, are all recovered from the from the cyclone. So oftentimes with coral restoration, you might be fragging live coral, um, but we had no need to do any fragging or breaking of live corals um, just because there was so much live coral rubble to work with. 
Um, so we did use several months after the uh, after the cyclone. We were still using any pieces that hadn't attached to the reef and were still were still vulnerable. So apologies in advance if the video that we're about to show you doesn't uh, uh, doesn't run properly. But what uh, what what you're seeing at the beginning is um, our local um, coral gardeners, and they're they're taking uh, the coral fragments that they've collected in these baskets, and they're um, putting them in the in the rope. So all 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 they're doing is opening up the rope and putting the coral fragment in. So um, we don't have any need for additional um uh, pollutants plastic like uh, cable ties the coral pieces that we're putting in are fairly small they're only a few inches long um th this this is how we're tying the uh, tying the ropes um to to the frames it's also how we adjust the ropes as the corals get heavier as they get larger um, it's important that the ropes are, 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 are free to sway so that they're, they're, they're not dragging on the on the bottom um, so, so that the, the corals are free to free to grow and it gives access to the um, to the reef herbivores like these uh, parrotfish that you can see in amongst the ropes. You can also see that the corals are getting very good lighting. Um, so they've got great access to light, uh, which helps them grow. Um, so you can see over time we get start getting some algal growth on the ropes. The parrotfish are very kindly helping us with that. Um, but over time, sometimes we might get you know, a bit a bit more algal growth, and then we have to get involved in, in some of the cleaning and aid the fish. So what you'll see here is, uh, is, is one of the coral gardeners and just um, with, a, with a simple scrubbing brush, just uh, brushing the algae off the, um, off, off the ropes, trying to keep the, 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 coral, um, the coral clear so it doesn't get smothered. So this is um, one, one of the nurseries and you'll see, hopefully see the change over just a, a few short months. So from this, September, December, and, and now- most recently in March. March 2022. So a lot of these corals are ready to be replanted onto the reef. Um, so the, the, the restoration project is still ongoing. Um, next month, we'll begin replanting some of the corals back onto the reef. Uh, we're at the end of the cyclone season and uh, water temperature uh, it's just beginning to to drop. So the 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 idea is that we're take planting them when they're less stressed. That way, hopefully, they've got plenty of time to become part of the reef before our next cyclone season. Um, and also, we've we've experienced a small amount of bleaching in some of um, Natoa Bay's shallow reefs. So we know that the coral at the moment is fairly stressed. The water temperature is fairly high. So if we can wait until next month, um, we can start replanting some of these corals back onto the reef. Luckily, with the help of um, plenty of people in each community, because it's it's a fairly labor intensive and time intensive process. Um, Fuzratu decided um, in a village meeting at the end of uh, November, start of December, um, that they, they decided to create a tambu area around um, both the coral nurseries um, and the really uh, nice thing is they're already starting to see uh, an increase in in size and number of, uh, of fish that are coming close to the village. Uh, the communities also gained a better understanding of the importance of corals. Um, they know that they're obviously linked to food, you know, food sustainability, um, but they now have a better understanding of how to do their own restoration efforts. Um, and they've received funding for various climate change resilience initiatives. Um, so some are interested, for example, in building seawalls, whereas others are more interested in you know, maybe mangrove root plantation projects or farming. farming. Um, various ways to to use their marine resources, but also protect them for future generations. Um, because again, that are for future generations and, and providing um, that same bounty for them. Um, in 2021, we're, we're also able to be part of the Duavata Conservation Leadership Program. Uh, 
Nukumbati private island in, uh, in Madhuwata, in the, the, the north of this island. Uh, they selected and transported uh, groups of youths from various communities in Madhuwata, um, and they oversaw the, the village projects each group initiated during, during the program. So over like a two day um, program, the groups learned about agroforestry from our friend, Dr. Richard Markham at Cocomana. Um, they were able to see various like, cash crops, um, you know, high return crops um, that are planted without deforestation. So without the need for, for large, you know, massive clearings of land. Um, so the idea was to, to kind of combine the ridge to reef um, elements. So looking at what having a healthy forest, what having healthy land means for your reefs. Um, and so they did a marine portion with us. Um, they joined us in Nintewa Bay um, and they got to see some of the healthy shallow reefs that are um, fringing right next to rainforest. So they saw intact forest, really healthy reef systems compared to areas with clearing where the coral was also severely degraded from, from runoff um, and from other pressures. They, um, they also got to visit some of the coral nurseries and learn about um, corals and how they grow um, and ways to restore them in the event of a cyclone like Yasa. Yeah. So, it, in addition to um, to, to the Duavata uh, Sustainable Tourism Collective, Coco Manor and funding from the uh, German Embassy in Wellington. Another um, Duavata pro project that we were really lucky to be involved with um, was the Village Exchange. We had um, some funding with the British High Commission in Suva, um, along with some of the leftover funding from the German Embassy in Wellington, and Duavata was able to facilitate an exchange program between Busaratu here in Thakin Grove um, and Ravi Ravi, which is a community in Madhuwata. Um, and so earlier this year, we um, we got together again with Nukumbati, Kokomana, and ourselves at Ocean Ventures, and we facilitated a um, village exchange program. So um, first, Ravi Ravi came to Busaratu. They got to experience their their homestays and how they how they host guests. Um, they got to visit their coral nursery. Um, and Dr. Richard Markham also took them to uh, Rainforest Reserve, West Southern Rainforest Reserve, um, and Kokomana, where they were treated to chocolate. And um, of course, the uh, the ideas behind agroforestry um, about how you can really grow a lot of valuable crops without disrupting the land that you're working on and keeping it um keeping it healthy for for the future um and then a couple of weeks later we had the reverse so busaratu got on a bus and um about 12 members of the community went up to um and Sakawa, they looked at the forests there um also went to kokoman and learned about agroforestry uh, and then went up to Ravi Ravi, where they got to see things like their their pearl farming initiative. Um, but really, most important, the most important part of this whole exchange was the Telenoa, the kind of chatting between these two villages, um, and the way they learned from each other. And and, it, and it's clear that it, it it's formed a very um, close bond now between the, the two communities, and and that that sharing of information, I think, is going to be is is going to be very valuable in the future. The previous project had focused around youth, so people aged like 16 to 25. Um, but this this program enabled um, a full range of ages, so about 16 to, I'd say, 60s yeah. or, or yeah. low 70s. Um, and having this mix of elders and, and youth was great because you need the full, you know, the full community, all the demographics to be on board um, when starting these larger village initiatives. So, what lessons have we uh, have have we learned over, over the past few uh, months and years? Well, um, f first and foremost, um, it's really important to follow the uh, the traditional protocols. So, for example, when we go into a a village for the first time, we present a seva seva, which is a a, a um, an offering of um, of kava roots. Yeah, kava. Um, 
the, the, the other thing that's interesting is that um, we, we found that continuity in, um, in, in the visits and programs is really important. Um, you, you, you don't really make any progress if you go and visit the community and then they don't see you again for two years. That regularity of contact is really, really important. Just taking the time to you know, have those telematics and have those chats with, with people um, at all different levels, you know, from the kids to, to the elders to, to really, uh, you know, spend time showing photos and, and taking them in the water um, or, you know, being on land with them and, and going through, for example, the valley in Mbembe, the, the butterfly house. Um, all of these things take a lot of time. Uh, there's definitely no rushing any type of eco tourism project. Um, Fiji time is a thing. <laughs> it is a thing. And you do have to do it right. And you want the entire community to be on board. So you have to give plenty of time for, for village meetings um, and, you know, the, the opportunity for everyone to get together and decide, do we even want tourists in our village? Um, and if so, what are our requirements for, for tourists coming into our village? Um, so th there's really no rush to it. It's important to move slowly, um, to be transparent, so everybody in the village knows what to expect, and um, and everybody can see the benefits equally. Um, and you don't want to create any type of you know political or, or social rift by by not having everybody on board. So it takes a long time to get to know a community, um, and it takes an even longer time for there to be that two way trust. Um, where you can move forward with big projects. Um, another thing that we've learned um, working in such a remote location and also with with the possibility of discovering things like new species um, without having proper management plans in place for for those discoveries, it can lead to problems. So um, it's important, for example, that the, the community has that kind of power and and involvement about the Natewa swallowtail that is um, only found in that region. Um, if that's open and, and just a free for all for visitors, um, that that benefit doesn't come back to the village at all. So it's important that they know how to harness um, their resources and make the most out of it before they're exploited by by people who won't return anything to the village. Um, we've really found that the best outcomes are achieved when the community, um, public and private sector can cooperate together and when you're involving all different demographics. Um, so youth, elders, women, you want to get everybody in the village kind of on board and excited um, and seeing the results. So having the before and afters, um, making sure that you're sharing, sharing updates at village meetings um, and just um, with our work with operate higher year. Um, so that's a very big project that's impacting a village uh, for a short period of time. So it's important that we have the opportunity to work with them year round um, and facilitate a program that will benefit them year round instead of a, a few select weeks throughout the year. So um, what do we have planned for the, for, for the future? Well, we're going to. Uh, we're, we're hoping to continue and expand the local education projects. We're we're, we're really keen on the um, on the exchange um, program that that does work really well. So hopefully we can do some more of that in in the future. Um, we, we're also going to be doing some training uh, specifically for for the community of Vuzaratu in, in in the next few weeks. That'll include uh, paddy dive training, um, first aid uh, first aid training, and um, a, a child protection um workshop because they're dealing with um with 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 tourists coming in who is some some of whom are young people and also they they have many young people in in the village so protect people in total um so that's just to give you an idea of the the size of the communities that we're working with um whereas um, one of the other villages that we work with a lot closer to where we're based is only about 25 to 30 um, and they're only accessible by by water. Um, so they've had very limited opportunity um, for for making money on any scale, even for them to bring 
um, their farming goods into town to sell would require a boat ride to a nearby village and then a, about an hour and a half bus ride into town, um, which is expensive um, and really just limits them in, in their opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got a couple of projects lined up with them, but again, moving very slowly um, and seeing what they want to do um, and what kind of pace they want to follow. Um, but we will be hosting Operation Wallacea again in Busaratu from June um, to July for four weeks. Yeah. We've got about 100 students coming. As, um, as, as previously mentioned, uh, over, over, the, over the coming months, which as, as we're going into winter, um with with cooler water temperatures so we're going to be um re replanting the corals um and then we'll we're going to be restocking the nurseries um hopefully at least in in part with some uh, thermally resistant corals so as we kind of work to establish ourselves as a as a small business in um Benoit Levu, we're also hoping that by gaining a reputation, we can we can do more to promote um, Busaratu eco tours, but also other village tourism initiatives. Um, try to get more tourists out into these parts of Fiji that have so much um, so much abundance of you know generosity and welcoming and um, amazing natural resources and people who don't normally benefit from the tourism that comes into Fiji. And uh, authentic experiences, authentic culture. So we'd like to end by um, first thanking the communities in Natewa Bay that have welcomed us, um, have made us feel like family, um, but especially those who have participated and helped with our coral restoration initiatives um, and have taken it on to be their own initiatives. Um, and the members from Busaratu who have been involved with establishing the Butterfly House, their forest nursery. Um, they've given us a lot of trust as well. Um, We'd also like to thank AVI, Australian Volunteers International. Um, Kokomana in Sabsabu. Our partners in a lot and yeah. our, our suppliers of chocolate. <laughs> um, Operation Malasia. Nature Fiji, Warangeti Viti. Um, Paddy Project Aware, which is helping us with some of the dive training um, for local communities. Um, the Two of Us Sustainable Tourism Collective. And our friends over at Nukumbati, um, who have been so involved in and making these village exchange programs. Uh, thank you all for listening to our seminar. And now we'll open it up for any uh, questions. Naka. Naka. Renaka, thank you, Sarah and Matthew. That was really, really awesome um, presentation. It was wonderful to see all of their beautiful sea life in Natiwa Bay and to hear about the work that Ocean Ventures Fiji is doing uh, and such important coral restoration work. Uh, even though the video that you shared was a bit more like a, a slideshow for uh, uh, at least on my end, I'm not sure what it was like, <laughs> but it was really fascinating to actually see the images of how that work is done. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and of course, it was great to see the local community involved in these different projects and how much work has gone into to keeping that relationship. Um, I think... For those of us that aren't in Fiji, which is many of us today, I think you've certainly enticed us to come and visit. And I mean, I'm keen, I was already keen to taste some of Kokomana's chocolate. Um, but, you know, now I'm keen to try out some snorkeling and, and meet the local community um, where you guys are there. So yeah, but I mean, more importantly, we're excited to see what work you do in the future. It seems like you've got some really awesome plans. So yeah, Vinaka, thank you. That was really awesome. I guess we will open it up for questions now. Um, we do have about 10 minutes, so we've got some time. I, I noticed earlier there was a question in the chat, so I might start with, with that one. Um, and it's from Ulu Kalesi. And they say, thank you so much for these excellent projects. What are the possibilities for local tertiary research around the work you are doing in Matewa Bay? That's a good question. I think I think especially as our kind of our, one of our end goals is um, working with communities that that want to establish if they want to establish like a tembu area on their reef. Um, and the important thing about establishing a no take or a tembu area um, really should be monitoring the change over time. 
Mm -hmm. um, so there's definitely the kind of opportunity to, to monitor fish populations over time, um, both from the, the sense of the effects of the tembu and for the, um, the effects of the coral restoration. Um, we were just trying to document as much as we can at the moment, um, but there's definitely further further research that could be done. This this area um, is still fairly underexplored and and fairly under researched. Um, so that's why we're trying to do some like basic benthic surveys and and fish surveys. But I think there's pretty unlimited potential for research. Um, to be done in this region, especially with a Definitely. high degree of endemism and uh, the potential for new species. Wow. So um, especially if we've got local academics interested in, in kind of pursuing it more. Um, we, we just like to work together with academic bodies and try to facilitate their, their research when possible. Mm. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, it would be great, I suppose, in the future to see some of FNU involved in some of these projects. Sure. Definitely. 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 Hmm. Um, I forgot to say before, would you two mind if you stop sharing your slides? Um, yeah. Just that way then we can kind of, if anyone does have any questions and they want to speak over the speaker, we can we can see them a little bit better. Um, so I will open it up Excellent. if anyone wants to speak out loud. If you've got any questions, you can switch your video on and turn your microphone off. Hi, I thought that was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. It was really interesting. I'm just wondering how the replanting of the corals, uh, how you go about that and what the success rate is of that. So this will be our first time replanting because uh, we've just done um, we've just done the nurseries with the rubble from the cyclones. Um, we were we were taught by um, Dr. Victor Benito, um, who runs Reef Explorers Fiji. Um, so his technique, which we're gonna be adapting is cementing um, the corals once they've grown to a size um, back onto the reef. So we'll have to cut them from the rope nurseries um, as they've kind of fused around, around the ropes themselves um, and then cement them directly onto bare areas of reef um, where they have enough room to grow without having some competition. <laughs> Well, that's great. Good luck with that. I hope that goes really well. I mean, you could see the growth you. when they were on the ropes. You could see the growth. It was really obvious. So well done. That's fantastic work. I was also just wanted to ask what the potential impact of having an extra oh, 100 people in the village uh, at any given time, or is that maybe I've got the numbers wrong. Uh, if there's an impact on the village or on the resources or or how you go about that? Definitely. So we've um, we've before the before the students kind of descend upon the village, we have a, we have a lot of meetings. I think the first year, both us and the village and everyone was really just kind of thrown into it. So yeah. the first year was for everybody a bit of a a, a sharp learning curve um, where I think there were some mistakes made, um, but also a lot of lessons learned. So one of the at some points when you've got a village of about 70 or so people and you've got, you know, at one point, maybe 40 or so students would be the maximum at one time. Um, but still 40 to 70 is a pretty big ratio of yes. tourists. Um, and I'm basically just asking them, you know, who wants it, which houses in the village are open to having homestays. Um, Operation Wallacea's main role was working with each homeowner about what would be a successful homestay. So doing some basic training. That, 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 that was really important, especially because we've we've had the, the two year hiatus um, due to the yeah. pandemic. So one, one, of, one of the very early conversations a, a few months ago was, do you actually want this again? And and yeah. there was a, a, a very enthusiastic yes, we oh, do. So it's from from our side and from Operation Wallacea's side and from Fuzaratu's side as well. How how do we do it in the um, in, in in the best way in the best way that we can? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank luck. you, Linda. Thank you. Naga. I think, as you both said, Sarah and Matthew, that community consultation is so important, which it, it does seem to be clear that that is going on <laughs> and you're doing a, a good job of it by the looks of things. Yeah. Oh, well, there's, there's a few thank yous in the chat. Um, I hope you both do get a chance to have a read of them 
towards the end when we, we do finish up. Uh, was there any more questions from anyone in the audience? Mel, did you have a question? Oh no, you're, you're on mute. <laughs> I just noticed in the chat, um, Dr. Sophia Ali just wanted to know how um, they could use the tertiary institutes like FNU um, to collaborate in the research. Um, if there's any other advice of how that connection could be possible, I suppose. Yeah, so the main the main research is happening. I mean, Matthew and I are the coral restoration is a separate project, but the main research that's happening is through Operation Molossia. Um, so Operation Molossia has contacted um, what they think are relevant academics and FNU, but to be honest, they're not here. So yeah. it's more kind of word of mouth who responds to emails, um, which is how they originally found Dr. Visheshni Chandra, who um, discovered the butterfly species. Um, so we, I think there just needs to be a bit more of like a communication between Operation Wallacea and perhaps like Nature Fiji and FNU to making sure that we're getting more Fijian specialists out there um, because it's a mix of Fijian and international specialists and it'll work best again if we've got more, definitely more, sure. more levels yeah. know a lot more about what's growing around here, what's living here, um, you know, that, that type of experience and knowledge just can't be replaced by anyone coming for for four weeks yeah. or eight weeks or anything well it seems maybe there aren't any more questions i do apologize dr sophia ali i did miss that one in the chat i, I just read thank you and i was like it's another thank you uh, <laughs> But there is another one there too. <laughs> so I better check it and make sure I don't, I don't think Rachel's got a question in there. Um, okay, well, if, if no one else has any more questions, I, I suppose we will we'll finish up for the session today. Um, I do want to thank you both again um, on behalf of Appia and everyone here today. Thanks for your wonderful presentation and taking the time out today to talk with us. I did get a, a little notification that popped up before to say, Sarah, that your bandwidth was low. <laughs> so, That's about right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which explains a lot um, considering your remote location. Uh, so we do appreciate the effort um, that you've both taken to, to join with us today. And, and thank you everyone else um, that has joined and connected with us today. Uh, we hope to see you at our, our next seminar, which is um, Wednesday, 25th of May, and we'll be hearing from the Pacific Climate Warriors, so it should be another really interesting session. Um, but otherwise, thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a really great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck.